Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today I've got a special guest here on the channel. This is Mr. Zeke Stout. Now uh, he's been on the channel before in some of our reloading content. Also in the past, I think we waterboarded a gun together for a video. We did. We had to torture it. You know, we had to prove to people that an inanimate object, no matter what you do to it, is not going to jump up and kill a bunch of people. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, he, he's here uh, with MGS Trade School, and we're going to be talking a little bit about, uh, you know, a company that he's now co-owner of, uh, but also just catching up with him. Um, it's been quite a while since we've had him on the channel, and he's a long-term uh you know, friend of the channel, been around a long time, and we've known each other a long time, so we thought it'd be fun to catch up. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a long road. We've been at this a long time, haven't we? <laughs> 12 years. I was in my hotel last night, and I was thinking, okay, when did Eric and I meet? It was 2012, and it was about February or March. It was right before that first range day. Yeah. And I walked into Moss Pond, and I was like, is that is that Eric guy here? And they're like, yeah. And you came down, hey, how's it going? You know, talking lead. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. And come to the range day. I'm like, what's the range day? I don't know. It's the first time we're ever having it. <laughs> we're going to blow up refrigerators. And I was like, all right, I'm there. <laughs> that first one was a little out of hand, I must admit. It, uh, it was, <laughs> but it, everybody was safe. Yeah, we we didn't, nobody got hurt well, much. We, we, we had some <laughs> we had some pieces of some appliances flying back. That was that was like when everybody was first getting into to binary explosives, yeah. and it was the Tannerite back in the day. Yeah, we didn't know what to put in what, and, and they were putting and, them in things that probably yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know a refrigerator could launch five hundred feet in the air. Well, but you know, it, we, it we found out pretty quick that yes. it's not a good idea to put a five-gallon bucket of binary explosives inside of a washing machine. We were we were SpaceX. It was a good idea, but it just wasn't a safe idea. We were SpaceX before SpaceX was SpaceX. <laughs> we were yeah, we launch, were launching refrigerators, la launching refrigerators and <laughs> microwaves and every every random appliance, broken appliance that we could find. Yes, those were the good old days. But um, how's life been? It's been good. Uh, you know, of course, ups and downs like anything else. The economy's been a little bit rough. Sure. Uh, but but things are going well. You know, it, since I've been on the channel last, which was years ago. It's been a while. I've had a TV show on Discovery Channel. Yeah. I, I am now part owner of MGS Trade School. And uh, doing that, doing some content with that, growing the school. Uh, just a lot of stuff going on. And it's weird because, you know, we were talking about catching up. And we hadn't seen each other in a while. And there's been lots of friends in the industry I have, whether I see them at SHOT Show or a convention or range day. Yeah. And it hits you. It's like, you don't, because of social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, you see everything that's going on in everybody's life and you feel like, oh, I know what's going on. And then you see them in person. You're like, oh my God, we haven't talked in like two years. Yeah. Like actually talk, talk. And I, that's, I think that's one of the downfalls of social media is you think you're still connected with the people because you see everything. Yeah. You know, you're watching you the don't kids grow, but you don't. Yeah. Right. There, there's bizarre. always sort of a, a hidden truth behind, you know, the face that people show on so, social media. And that's yeah. a really good observation, Zeke, yeah. because, you know, I feel like, you know, people tend to treat social media as this sort of looking glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, and sometimes it's a looking glass and sometimes it's a mirror. And, uh, you know, there's a reason, uh, you know, that... Uh, you, you know, the narcissist, what is narcissist, what, what is that, that guy's Narcissus. name? Narcissus. Yeah, Narcissus. Yeah. You know, he looking down, in, you know, looking down into the, into the uh, image of himself in the water and adoring yeah. himself in the water. I mean, that, that's kind of what social media really is, is that mirror, that narcissist mirror. It, it is. Of, you know, you, you project your own insecurities, but also, I guess, the things that you, you really enjoy the most. You, you want to get that dopamine rush of people yeah. approve of, <laughs> of and, what you do. And they've done studies now where they, they show the dopamine release and everything when you see a like, when you see a positive comment, when yeah. you see... And it's bizarre how people will get addicted to it. And I'll say, I'll say from experience, I have too. You know, there's been times when I've been trying to grow a brand or grow a, a different platform and I'll see, you know, 30 likes in the first minute. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Sure. Whoa, whoa, that doesn't matter. Hang on. Just dial it back. Don't worry about that. You just put it out there because you enjoy it. You know, yeah, yeah. Thing. So you have to remind yourself. Of that. You have to remind yourself that not everything needs to be driven just for, for clicks and for yeah. likes. And I think we get trapped into that and, you know, no one wants to know the negative stuff. No. And most no, people no, don't no. want to share the negative things. So when you when you do get to catch up with people, 
you know, you kind of get to know a little bit more of what's going on in, in, in reality. And yeah. I think that's important, you know. Yeah. Check in with your friends, y'all. I guess yes. that's what we're really trying to say here. <laughs> exactly. Don't, uh, don't rely on social media to assume that your buddies are okay. Uh, sometimes it's great to, to check in, and that's what we're doing now, of course. I have a question for you. Yeah. Did you wear a hat that says way huge because I was going to be here? Actually, that is pretty... <laughs> That is pretty fitting. My buddy George is going to like that. Okay, yeah. George Trips is the owner of Way Huge, and uh, they're an effects pedal company. Okay, nice. They make effects pedals yeah. for guitar. You, you know, still guitar doing the guitar board. stuff? I do, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I love awesome. playing, but George is a great guy, and uh, he sent me this hat, so I was like, all right, I'm going to wear it. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it fits. Yeah, absolutely. Why really, I'm on a stool. I'm really this. Hang on, let me step down. Yeah, this yeah. is the real me. Yeah. Look, <laughs> Zeke, oh. Zeke is... Look, I promise I am not short. Zeke is just freakishly tall. I am. He is I'm from Tennessee. Adventure. He's from the, he, there's something in the water up there, like you and Hickok. When I was, and, and I was born in Texas <laughs> and raised in Tennessee, so I got a double dose of yeah, that. Yeah, you got, you got the water, though. Drinking the water in Tennessee must have, you know. <laughs> and that was so weird. Back when we had Talking Lead, you know, one of the things that kind of grew Talking Lead really quick is we had Hickok on our fourth episode. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know, we started Talking Lead in a Mexican radio station. When now they had all gone home from the day and they let us use the studio, right on. So Hickok <laughs> comes in. One, I didn't know he was six nine. Yeah, he walks in. I'm not used to people towering over me, and I'm like, oh my lord. Yeah, he's, he's taller than you. Yeah, he's taller than me. By a John pretty Bo. good bit. A couple inches, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he came on, and that kind of took off from there. But then we started realizing, <clears throat> within 30 minutes of each other, was Hickok 45, us with talking lead. Um, you had TN Outdoors 9. Oh, yeah, Tommy. Uh, you had 22 Plankster. We were all like in this little circle in Middle Tennessee, and, and it's kind of wild how that's that the happened. early wrecking crew, the y'all. Old days. That is the wrecking crew. <laughs> yeah. That's the wrecking crew. It's Tommy, Dave, Greg, yep. you, me, yep. and Tim. like, and Tim. Yeah. Like, that's the wrecking crew. And, and then, with if you expand out an hour, <laughs> you had Jaeger. Mm-hmm. who was right down the road you had artisan tony which i don't know if he does content anymore but he was a big one back then yeah uh who else was around there i mean we, it was all this world and then if you expanded three hours down to atlanta you had you guys and oh yeah. man it, it it's this weird the little... east coast wreck youtube wrecking crew. yes that's, that's what, what we, we were, were man <laughs> and we still are we still yeah. are we, we still do our thing we just use our rockers now no. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's all good so how are things going with the uh, with the gunsmithing school? That's good. Is that something uh, you you've gotten into fairly recently? I want to say fairly recently, yeah. but the last couple of years, two or three yeah, years. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I started back with them in January of 2020. Shot Show okay. 2020 was my first foray with MGS Trade School, and it's been great. You know, it's good. it's one of those things where I truly believe in distance education for gunsmithing. You know, there's there's a few of us out there, and we all do a good job of it in our own way. And with ours, I wanted to make sure we had more hands-on projects. So I wanted to make sure we had toolkits. You know, one, th- one thing with, with students, you'll get a message back and they're like, hey, I built this gun at the end and uh, how do I start a business with that? And you're kind of like, oh, you know, if you go to auto diesel college and you graduate, you graduate with a pile of tools. You know, that way you can go to any shop, any body shop, any mechanic shop, any dealership and say, hey, I want to be your mechanic. Here's all the tools I got. Let me... Let me start. And yeah, and at least you have right. a certificate, something in hand to say, hey, I went through this certification, exactly. this training, exactly. that sort of thing. You know, one, one of the common, you know, let's just say gripes that I hear from students of online gunsmithing schools of all types right. is that it is a, a fairly saturated market mm-hmm. uh, to some degree and that some students tend to think that it it's, can be hard to get a job in the gun industry. Uh, the gun industry is a very large and growing industry, and of mm-hmm. course, we see since the boom in 2020 that, uh, gosh, we've got uh, not only is the gun industry growing, but there are a lot more gun owners, mm-hmm. and many of those people come from many, many different backgrounds, and I think that the background of people that we have coming into the fold in the last four or five years uh, tend to be people that take this uh, craft maybe a little more seriously at a, let's just say, a scholarly level. Yeah. You know, they want to learn how to take their gun apart and clean it. They want to yeah. learn, uh, you know, the basics. And maybe they don't want to be a gunsmith by trade, mm-hmm. but maybe they want to be self-sufficient enough to be able to take care, you know, the kind of person that wants to change their own oil, rotate their own tires, yeah. do their own brake pads, 
maybe they're adventurous enough to uh, change out uh, something like a water pump or yeah. an alternator or something like that on their car. You know, they'll go to YouTube University and so forth and do that sort of thing. Are you finding that with uh, your school mm -hmm. that do you think there's people that are taking a course like yours just for the good preparedness that it gives them and to yeah. just get good general knowledge of the craft? So typically, even if they're not considering a, 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 a career. career? Yeah, and that's kind of why we broke ours down into three different levels. You know, you don't have to take them all. You know, they're not a concurrent. You got to take this, to take this, to take this. You can take any of them at any point. In time. Yeah, so if you think, hey, I'm I'm at more of an advanced level, you can you just can go ahead and that. take the advanced exactly. version. Uh, so the basic is that dip your toes in the water. I just want to learn basic maintenance, basic repairs. Uh, you still have four hands-on projects with that one, and it's it's very affordable. You know, it's kind of like. Hey, I don't really think I want to be a gunsmith, but I do want to learn more about maintenance and repair and ma and maintaining the gun. Sure. Uh, so the basics kind of for me. And then the people that are like, no, I know I want to be a gunsmith. They do either take advanced or advanced too. Sure. And advanced is kind of that, okay, I definitely want to be a gunsmith. This is what I want to do. There's a lot of people that are in the industry. Maybe they're accountants or something and they work sure. in a toothpaste factory, but they want that certificate. So sure. they come and they get that, that knowledge base from us. And then advanced two is that I want to be a gunsmith, but it's also kind of the entrepreneurial route. So you get almost $1,400 worth of tools when you graduate. Uh, you get the build kit at the end and you get all of the education that you get in advanced one. So yeah. we kind of give you everything you need. If you want to start an FFL in your garage and start your own gunsmithing business, we give you everything you need to launch that and take off. So. Yeah, you know, I think <clears> if a person is... You know, say that someone wants to, uh, you know, maybe get into the gun industry, but maybe they don't want to be a gunsmith. Maybe they just want to work on the retail side and sell guns. Maybe they're really yep. good with people and they enjoy uh, selling firearms. Yeah. You know, maybe they're just really good at talking to people and, and that's their vibe, you know. I think that something like a gunsmithing school will be good even if you're just going to sell guns because then you at least understand all the different types of actions mm -hmm. and how to operate them and clear them safely and how to, you know, if a customer comes with you a basic problem, you can maybe just kind of help them diagnose a really basic problem right there without having to bother the gunsmith. So, like, I think that makes you look better, too. I mean, if you're in a position where you're working retail, and um, you can help your gunsmith, say that the retail establishment does have a full-time gunsmith, and say that someone brings in a problem, and it's just a quick little thing to diagnose. Uh, I don't know, a magazine spring on a shotgun got coil bound, or you know, someone comes and says, hey, can you pull the plug out of this old hunting shotgun so it holds more shots? I mean, those are just basic things. You should know how to pull the magazine tube apart on a shotgun and take the plug out for somebody. Like, then you don't need to bother the gunsmith for that. But with like a basic knowledge level, you know, you can kind of assess those basic things. And then eventually the gunsmith starts to go, okay, you know, you have a decent understanding of the basics. And maybe that gunsmith will then go, well, hey, do you want to learn more? I can teach you a few things. Maybe one day a week on your off day, you come in here and help me at the shop and I'll pay you an extra day out of my own pocket and, and you can do a little work under me. That's how some people get into gunsmithing. You know, yep. you work under another gunsmith. You yep. have to work your way up. You know, you may not just walk in the door and go, I want to be a gunsmith. Sometimes, you know, you have to sort of apprentice under a person, and that's even with some higher training. It's just the higher training gives you a good foot in the door mm -hmm. to be able to go, wow, I have a good working basis so that now this gunsmith has a really good thing to work with. I'm going to apprentice under this guy, and I'm going to have a good working knowledge and skill set to go off of um, to help me learn more efficiently and not waste the gunsmith's time. And hey, more importantly, maybe even get a job working with him as an assistant. And who knows, maybe even eventually he might want to leave and you become the gunsmith. And yeah. that's how it happens. You, you, you generally work your way into it. And eventually that person moves on to something else. They quit or whatever. And now you're the gunsmith. And it's, it's something I hear all the time is like, <clears throat> okay, if I take your course or any other course, Am I going to be a good guns? What's going to make me the best gunsmith? I can't tell you that. You know, we're an accredited school. So one, there's a rule against me saying that to you. But two, just logically, I know doctors that went to Harvard Medical School and they suck as doctors. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't matter where you go to school. It, it, it matters how you apply the, the, the knowledge and the education uh, that we give you or anybody else gives you.
That's so right. It, it, it's up to you what you do with that knowledge. That's right. Yeah. I think that's the best way to look at yeah. online gunsmithing schools no. in general because I think that a lot of people have sort of cast, you know, let's just say a scrutinizing eye upon the practice mm -hmm. of online gunsmithing schools. And no. I think that's important to remember that, you know, you still have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. You still have to be uh, motivated mm -hmm. uh, to get out and get into the industry somehow. And you've got to be motivated to get your foot in the door somewhere. It yeah. may just, you may be working the gun counter for a while. Then you might be working one day a week with the gunsmith. Then you might be working two or three days a week. And then they go, wow, I need you enough that you're not going to be on the sales counter anymore. I need you in the shop. Yeah. And then eventually you evolve. I mean, you do have to work your way up in the industry. And uh, believe me, I've, for the last 17 years, I've been, uh, you know, doing this YouTube stuff and, um, it, it's been a journey. It, it, I didn't start out, you know, by having, you know, 2.8 million subscribers on YouTube and, and 750 million views. You know, it took me one view at a time, one video at a time and, and, and putting the content out there and eventually get there. I and think I, when we met 12 years ago, you were at 200 or 300,000, something like that, something like yeah. that. And I was just like, which felt astronomical at the yeah. time. <laughs> and I remember when you hit a million, you said something I'm like, what it's like we couldn't even register wait a million subscribers that doesn't okay all right that's happening okay. that's 10 <laughs> that's 10 roman coliseums packed full of people yes so 2.7 million people it's is 20. 27 roman coliseums full of people okay let's stop bragging <laughs> i'm just saying but but you know it's a lot of people and it is. and people tend to really for, forget the the power that social media has because it uh it is such an interesting way for people to engage with their peers and the people that uh, that they feel are like-minded and that think like them yeah. and that they relate to. Well, and from a business perspective, you know, I, I, I come from the content creator side doing, you know, the YouTube, the podcast, all that stuff. Now I'm in the business side of the gun industry and I see the power of what social media, YouTube, stuff like that did versus print media versus television media versus anything like that. And, and those all have their place. They all have their place. They're expensive. So if you're a startup, it's hard to get in in those places. But you can approach an influencer, even if it's a, a somebody that's starting up. You know, they've hit 5,000, 10,000 subscribers and say, hey, let's grow together. You know, but there is so much power in meeting the right people in the content creation side that give a crap, you know. Because some people will just throw out content. It doesn't. If they get a free gun, if they get a free bag, if they get a free education, whatever, yeah, I'll do a video about it. Well, if you're constantly doing that, I really don't want to sponsor you because how's where's the value to your demographic that you talk to, whether or not you know I'm gonna do what you're saying to do, you know, buy, yeah, enroll, whatever. I think <laughs> that there's there's certainly a fine line between you know, a video just serving as an informational yep. dump. And, and and that's fine if a video doesn't really have a lot of opinion, but yeah. let's just say it's, it's just information. Sure. Um, there's a lot of tech stuff that I watch. And uh, the videos, quite frankly, no offense to you guys that make these videos, but some of them are quite boring. <laughs> uh, however, the information's good. So I sit through it because it's good information and it's presented in a way that uh, that my ADD self can uh, receive the information. If I'm uh, looking at video cards, or I'm looking at sound cards, or I'm looking at uh, processors, or a computer case, or I'm going to build a computer, or whatever, or hard drives, I'm going to watch all the nerdy, techie videos I can. And yeah, most of them are going to be hard to get through, but at least the information's there. I think that everyone had that cool science teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're in college or high school, whatever school you know, level you have under your belt, you know, especially high school. Because high school, you know, that's when you first, you have your first real science teacher that actually, you know, might, might do a dangerous experiment in the class from time to time. And I mean, it's passionate ev about it. Everyone has a science teacher that, that, you know, put the gas inside the, the big bubble and set it on fire, made a big fireball in the room. I mean, come on, you, you guys all have that science teacher. Everyone remembers that person. Uh, uh, one of them, uh, he actually put uh, soap in a bucket <laughs> right and then he put the uh he put the, the nozzle for the gas down in the soap and of course the, the the gas expanded made a big old bubble out of the top of the bucket and you touch a little <sighs> it makes a big fireball you know everyone remembers a cool science teacher that did the dangerous unhinged <laughs> what, stuff what, what i'm cracking up about i have add too 
and I see your ADD or my ADD in you. It, yeah. It's like, all right, we're talking about teachers and oh, the all oh, the soap. But did you see the soap where the yeah. bubble went up? Like, yeah. This? Oh crap! I got to get back to but, the science teacher. But, but everybody <laughs> has that cool teacher that yeah. they can relate to, and I think that that's what uh, with the YouTube stuff. That's what makes such a powerful, you know relationship between viewer yeah, and, and, and and content creators when they view you as just being a, a person that they like to learn from yeah yeah they, and they, getting back to you know with mgs and, and with you know distance learning i think that's why distance learning is so powerful if you can engage on that level and be a cool teacher you know you can really get some effective learning done uh, even through through distance and, and through platforms like YouTube where people are making content. Oh, absolutely. That's why it's such a powerful tool. And it, it's something nowadays, especially let's talk about the gunsmithing realm, is it is an industry where the best gunsmiths in the world are retiring or passing away. You know, it's, yeah. it's a lot of older guys that are doing this and women. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an opportunity if you're younger and you really are passionate about firearms, you want to repair firearms, you want to be a gunsmith, for you to kind of grab grab it by the you know what and and go with it because sure. there's so much opportunity i can count on one hand within 200 miles of where i live how many people i trust my guns with and that's not good because guess what all those guys are booked out two years you know you know that so, is a really mm. good point that you make there yeah. um i know one of the one of the people that i used to order a few things from and also do some work uh from was bill turnbull and uh, Turnbull Customs. Now, I think, I hope I'm not going to be wrong here. I think his son is doing a lot of the restoration work now at Turnbull. I think, I think Bill retired, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that's just an example of how, you know, some, someone like Turnbull Restorations that does really good work. I mean, of course, uh, Mr. Mark Novak at Anvil Gunsmithing is a really good friend of mine. And, He's awesome. <laughs> and, and look, I love Mark to death, and, and I know Mark is going to live another 100 million years. I'm never going to suggest that he's ever going to be gone. <laughs> However, you know, Mark's not getting any younger. And luckily, Mark is the kind of guy who takes on a lot of apprentices and he trains a lot of people and has, ha has passed down a lot of really useful knowledge, not only uh, to his apprentices, but also on his channel. He has documented many of the, of the things that he does to help the community at large. And um, it, so there are a lot of these really you know, master level gunsmiths mm -hmm. that, you know, they're retiring and unfortunately they're dying off and passing away and they're not going to be around forever. And mm -mm. you know what, what I worry is that, you know, what happens if one day there's nobody left that knows how to do high level checkering or engraving, or, you know, no one knows how to do really good steel bed and glass bed work or glass bed repairs, or someone doesn't know how to free float barrels or understand barrel harmonics and blueprinting actions and things like that. You know, what's going to happen if, you know, people forget how to rust blue, uh, hot bluing techniques, yeah. do's and don'ts. I mean, all of these things that took people decades of trial and error to mm -hmm. learn. And there's so much useful information out there that these people can pass down. Um, it would be a shame for people to not take up the torch. And if they have a passion for working on guns, there absolutely is uh, very, very much so um, a need uh, for people that are willing to learn it at that master level. Yeah. Um, you know, rust bluing is a really laborious process. It takes forever. <laughs> and it takes a careful hand and a patience and a lot of time. But I'm going to tell you, uh, if you've ever seen something like a Luger that's been rust blued to perfection, uh, it's, or a nice old Winchester that's been rust blued to perfection. It's a sight to behold. And uh, it's, funny it, it's an the, art form. It's funny you say the glass bedding because the day I met you, you were glass bedding a Mosin Nagant. Yeah. I'll never forget it. You were, I walked up and you're like, oh, I'm just accurizing this Mosin. I'm like, what? And you're like, here, come here. I'll check this out. And he was glass bedding a Mosin. And I'm like going, okay. All right, that's like a $60 rifle. It's at like the putting time. the lipstick on a pig. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it was a $60 rifle at the time. Now there's like more acroglass than the gun was worth <laughs> to begin with. It's probably true. It's like, man, they used more steel bed than the gun's even worth. It's, <laughs> and it's funny, you know, the Mosin at the time was so inexpensive. You can buy them for nothing. Yeah. Anywhere. Now they're 500 bucks. We but, were messing with them. Oh, man. My, my, yeah. my Mosin that I have, I will never get rid of it because I bought it. Took it out to Hickox range because we were going to do a video out there. Yeah. Took the Cosmoline off. He's like, see if you can hit the gong. Very first shot, 200-yard gong on Hickox range. Nailed it. I'm like, I'm never getting rid of this gun. <laughs> I have. It, it, I paid 120 bucks for it, but I'm never getting rid of it. 
There you go. <laughs> and you did it with Greg. I did it with you. Greg. I mean, yeah. like, that's yeah, cool. You can't beat that. I've still never been to Greg's range before. What? Never been there. I thought you'd been out there before. Never. Jeez, Greg. Greg, we have to change that. I'm coming. I'm coming to see you. I'm going to bring some machine guns. <laughs> Anyway, not to call him out. I'm texting I, John I, I'm, now. I'm gonna I'm gonna text John right now and be like, we have to change that. But yeah, man, it's good to catch up. And um, mm -hmm. you know, so overall with the with the trade school, yeah, how's it been growing? Has it been going well? It's been good, uh, especially the the way we're structured financially, price wise, not financially, but the price of the school is very affordable. And I know the economy stinks right now, and hopefully, oh, wow. hopefully, we're climbing out of it. We know why, but. Um, just the the cost for ours, you know, our basic program is twenty one hundred bucks. Our advanced one is twenty eight, twenty nine hundred, and then our advanced two, where you get all those tools, the build, everything, is still only fifty nine ninety nine. So it, it's an affordable thing. So we've been seeing it. We we did hit a little bit of plateau because of the economy, but we're we're still having their growth. Good. You know, it's it's good. It's fun. It's fun getting the responses back from the students. That's one thing I love because. Our motto on the website everywhere is keeping the students first always. Uh, so if you know somebody writes in, they're like, "This is wrong." Took the test, this question, researched it, it's wrong. I'm gonna go back and look. I'm gonna be like, "Okay, yep, they're right. We'll change it. We'll make it right." Uh, we haven't had to do that yet, but we will. And so we, we're constantly keeping the curriculum up to date with new stuff that comes out, but then also just making it good for the students. So when they invest in what they're taking from us, they feel like they can get out in the world to do it. Cause that's why we have all those hands-on projects too. That's I mean, awesome. Everything from, you know, your, your first hands-on project with us, you get a beat up old M1 grand stock and you got to refinish it, hmm. stain it, wood, everything. Okay. Uh, then you solder two pieces of metal together. Just two little pieces of metal. It's our most complained about project because people think, Oh, solder. And I did that in school with a motherboard. No, nah. it's not the same. <laughs> So we'll be like, I can't get these things to stick together. And they're cussing and emailing. And we're like, okay, did you follow the instructions? Well, no. And they go back and follow the instructions. They get it right. And they get it. Um, and then uh, cool little things like we have a little three-inch piece of barrel that's all rusted and beat all to crap. And they have to prepare it for bluing. So they get all these hands-on projects to where they're, they're constantly working on gunsmithing things. They may not think soldering two pieces of metal together is important as a gunsmith. But, I mean, you did it for years. You know, there's stuff like that that happens all the time. Yeah. And my favorite project that we have, there's there's eight total projects in advance, too. But my favorite one is they have to learn to make their own hand tool. Because in gunsmithing, I mean, you, you've got a lot of old stuff here. The tools probably don't exist anymore. You can't just type up brown L's and go, hey, I need this for an old, you know, early 1900s Ruger revolver, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> tools. Right. Right. So we teach them how to fabricate their own hand tools. And it's an old Ruger revolver where they can't get the tool anymore for it to break it down. And we teach them how to make that. But if you talk to any gunsmith or go to any gunsmith shop, there's usually a bucket on the corner of their bench that has a ton of hand tools that they fabricated themselves because they can't order those tools anymore. So, I made a mm. uh, sight pusher for a, uh, a, Smith & Wesson M&P pistol one yeah. time. I, I didn't have quite the exact uh, shape of, of sight pusher. Yeah. And, you know, it is so interesting you mentioned that, is that the best gunsmiths make their own tools. And, and, and look, I'm just going to give you a little, 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 little tidbit here, okay? This will help you if you are wanting to get into gunsmithing. It's also a great way to save money. Because the thing is, if a customer comes in and they need a, a very specific job performed, and you don't have a tool, if you can make the tool, sure, it might take you a couple hours to make the tool, but you know what, you just saved yourself $150 having to buy the tool, and then you could tell the customer you had to buy the tool mm -hmm. and charge them for the tool, or you don't tell them that, you just work it into the price. That's how it works. You know, if I say, well, I can do this job for you, but I'm gonna have to probably order a specific tool, and yeah, it's, it's gonna be a little higher than my normal rate. So yeah, I'm gonna have to charge you $175, whatever, uh, well, I'm actually making $175 in profit because I just spent an extra two hours making that tool and I did your job in probably five minutes. And then, yeah, I have two hours and five minutes in the job, but I have that tool forever and I still charge you for it. Yeah. So actually, you bought the tool for me in a way. Yeah. And that's the way a gunsmith rationalizes it is your time is your time. And you want to bill out as much of your time as you can. I don't want to give $150 to... Um, gunsmithing supply house. I want to give $150 to my pocketbook. I want yeah, to make the tool myself. Exactly. 
So that's where the rubber meets the road is tool and die, you know, making your own tools. Mm -hmm. It was a very important part of being a well-rounded gunsmith. Yeah. There's even, you know, people that are cutting their own dyes and doing their own, making their own chamber reamers. You know, that's kind of more advanced stuff. Uh, a friend of mine has uh, made some of his own, uh, you know, bullet mold reamers, you know, cherries uh, for cutting bullet molds. And that's a fun process, kind of more trial and error sort of thing. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of interesting uh, roads you can go down, especially if you have a CNC machine. Uh, you can do a lot of crazy stuff with a CNC machine, y'all. You know, so many fun things that you can do. And I think that is a, like the apex of gunsmithing is when yeah. you say, hey, uh, I've got this weird rifle. I'm going to do a chamber cast, figure out what cartridge it is. Okay, I did my chamber cast. We identified the cartridge. I'm going to make my brass. So I'll draw something else off of an existing piece of brass. All right, it's a weird bullet diameter. It doesn't exist. Well, I'm going to make a bullet mold yep. from scratch cast my own bullet that's where you really get into the deep minutia of what it means mm -hmm. to be a gunsmith if you can create something from nothing well, create a cartridge that doesn't exist and it, it, it's a weird space at least we're not in commercially now. yeah <laughs> it's it's a weird space we're in now with the term gunsmithing because that term comes from it was a gunsmith they used to actually smith their own parts you didn't have brownells you didn't have midway you say you didn't have all these companies where you can just go boop, order the part they used to have to smith them, you know, sometimes even on a hammer and anvil. Uh, but, you know, CNC machines, lays, all this stuff. And the machining is an important aspect. And that's the biggest question we get a lot is how do I learn the machining online? You don't. <laughs> I tell people all the time, a lot of junior colleges in most states have a machining program. It's like six weeks long, cost a few hundred bucks. Get that certificate for basic machining. You're not going to learn how to use CAD work and everything in the CNC, but you'll learn how to use a lathe, the mill, all these different things. The reason we don't teach it online is just cut and dry, something easy breezy. It's a liability. You know, it's hard for me to say, here's concepts on how to use a lathe. Now go over that to that thousand dollar machine, thousands of miles from where I am. And good luck. Hope you don't get your long hair caught in it. Hope you don't get your shirt caught right. in it. You know, there's a huge liability to that. So. The only thing that I will add there is that not only the liability, um, but, but two is, you know, that is something that's a very hands-on thing. And that, yeah. that, that's a very tough thing to teach remotely. And um, if you are considering getting into machining, no. you know, you want to do some work with mill and lathe. Um, once you go down that rabbit hole, you know, look, you can check like Facebook Marketplace. Mm -hmm. You can check a lot of your local classifieds. You know, there's tons of local resources where people are always selling like an old Bridgeport yep. or something like that. And, and you know, as long as it's, it's solid and been well kept and, you know, in good shape, maybe it comes with some tools. The best way to approach that is just start playing around with it a little bit. You know, get a few books, read up on it and just start start moving some metal. And learn the safety Start with aspects. some bull crap. <laughs> Start with some cut off barrel sections that you don't care if you mess them up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got some scrap barrels, practice threading that barrel a hundred times. You know, thread it, then cut it off, thread it again, cut yep. it off, thread it again, and thread it a hundred times until you've got it perfect. And then, and then you have it. And you might be down to a two inch barrel at that point <laughs> in time. But hey, you learned how to do it. That's right. That's right. So. <laughs> You know, it, it is interesting. You know, uh, gunsmithing has always been a real fascinating thing for me. And I, I've always been sort of a hobbyist gunsmith, but I have done it professionally as well for some time. I did a lot of parkerizing work uh, mm -hmm. at Moss there when I worked under Ray. I did Duracoat. I sprayed Cerakote. Uh, we did a lot of Sega conversions, 922R Sega conversions on both rifles and shotguns. And uh, that was always fun. So I got my, my toes dipped in it. I wouldn't say I'm a career gunsmith, but I've done it enough to, uh, to enjoy it and see you know, all sides of it, the good and bad. Sometimes a project doesn't quite come together in the way you think. Sometimes you tell a customer, oh, it's going to be this much money, and then you go, oh, oh boy, it's going to be more than that. <laughs> it's, it's like being a, a mechanic, right? And, yeah. and someone says, well, how much is it going to cost to fix my car? And you go, well, based on every car like this I have fixed in the past, I know it's going to be X amount of dollars, but then you get in under the hood and you go, whoa, there's way more going on here than I thought. And wow, my experience is a great teacher, but boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and sometimes that's how gunsmithing is. You, you get under the hood, you get the gun apart, and you realize, wow, these springs are cooked. Uh, wow, this firing pin's broken. Yeah. 
holy crap, these uh, screw heads are all boogered up and, and messed up and they're all going to have to be replaced. They're so, they're so mashed up and messed up that they can't be uh, ground down and, mm -hmm. and resurfaced. That we have to be replace them. And then, you know, you get into a Browning A5. It has a whole bunch of time screws. Uh, if you ever have to replace a time screw on a nice, finely engraved Browning A5, you wind up finding, wow, this is getting expensive really quick. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you'd have to know what your boundaries are, and you have to be clear with the customer, hey, this could be very cheap, and this is what I think it could cost, but, hey, it may all cost a lot of money in some cases. So communication yeah. is an important thing. Make sure you communicate with your customer. And make sure that you know you be upfront with them and go, hey, I, th I think it, I think we could be here, but hey, this price is, is a range, okay? It could go a little higher if oh, I yeah. get under the hood and I find something worse, you know. Absolutely true. Yeah, and and believe me, you will find something worse. Uh, I, I've seen so many crazy. I, I could do a whole other video just talking about all the gunsmithing horror stories that, I, many, that I've come up. How with. many bags of parts have people brought in to make a gun? Yeah. <laughs> yep. We we had one customer like that all the time, Zeke. That would that would bring in 1911 parts all the time, and it would be a a, a mixed match <laughs> bag of 1911 parts. He would go to a gun show and buy a 1911 frame, a 1911 slide, and a whole bunch of parts. And he would bring us a hey, I tried to put this together, it won't go together. And he would expect us to you know turn this bag of parts into a functional 1911. And of course, I mean we could do it obviously as long as the parts were compatible i mean you know you can't bring me the wrong stuff mm -hmm. but he would bring the right parts but they would all require a lot of fitting and of course we'd make it work for him but it's kind of like bro by the time you went and bought all these parts and then brought it to us and by the time we have to charge labor you could have just bought a decent gun to begin with yeah. so you have to understand the boundaries of what you're getting into when you do decide wow it might be an attractive option to buy a random bag of parts at a gun show yep. and turn it into a gun. Well, if you're willing to do the work yourself and willing to accept that there might be some approachable failure in your future uh, that you may not expect, by all means, go for it. Uh, and and sometimes, you, <laughs> sometimes you find a diamond in the rough. You know, my, yeah. one of my favorite bag of guns, bag of parts guns stories is a good buddy of mine. His father-in-law used to go down to Mexico and antique. And he'd just find antique stuff all over the place. Didn't know guns, you know, from a hole in the ground. But this guy said, hey, I have this bag of gun parts. It's probably worth a lot of money. I was told it was worth a lot of money. And if you take it back to the States and have, you know, somebody fix it up or whatever, you probably got something good there. And he starts telling me, he goes, yeah, I got a, I got a good bit of money for it. I was like, what'd you sell it for? He goes, oh, I got like, you know, 15 grand for it. I was like, wow, what'd you get? He goes, it was a colt walker i almost fell down and what? cried i'm like 15 grand i'm oh like you could have bought your house for that thing right. and it is like no so this is a really valuable pistol. oh yeah. yeah it was just it was just a he said it was a plastic bag full of parts he brought it back to the states had the guy fix it up um i think the guy that fixed it up bought it from him for 50 grand 15 grand and probably turned around and sold it for 100 plus uh but yeah it was an original colt walker Original numbers, everything. No all, telling all the where it came oh, from. Oh my gosh! But no yeah, telling where it came from. Down in Mexico in a bag, and, and that's the funny thing. Some gunfighter got killed and oh, lost yeah. that thing. Oh, right? absolutely. Uh, it, some Mexican it, popped him and took that gun. And, and what's funny about the Walker? It's it's been touted as the most valuable handgun today. Like if you found one, it's worth more than most other handguns. Yeah. But it was a crap revolver. That was the thing. It was, yeah. but it, because it was crap, Colt didn't make a lot of them. So it's rare. So it's rare, yeah. you know, and, and it happens. <laughs> all, you never know. A Lorsen 380 may be rare, you know, 20 years from now. Don't say that. <laughs> oh, man. God, R be rare because nobody wants them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many of those things I had come through the shop. That's a whole other story. Oh, yeah. That was my first pistol. Tons of them. First pistol I ever had was yeah. a Lorsen 380. Well, usually your most affordable <laughs> pistols are the ones that people Ooh. tend to encounter first. I know? was 21 years old. I wanted my first handgun, and uh, the guy I was working for at the time had a Lorsen 380, and he gave me a heck of a deal on it. I'm thinking, oh, wow, I can afford that. Yeah, yeah. And I started shooting it. Oh, but can you? It was like, <laughs> That's the question. It was like two shot stovepipe, two shot stovepipe, one shot stovepipe. I'm like, oh, yeah. it was such a pain. There's a fine line between a gun that, that is cheap and a gun that is a piece of crap. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, like, you, you don't want to waste your money on something that's going to be an absolute turd, but you also, it's you, know, you have to understand where that value spectrum kind of lies. Like, you know, yes, there is a, a low-end value spectrum, but, you know, you got to spend a certain amount of money to get a decent gun. It, it, it's kind of like, use the high point for an example, right? Yeah. It's cheap. But I know this channel that did a torture test of it once. I think they <laughs> rammed a bolt down the, the barrel and shot it, and it didn't work. But then they took the bolt out, and it still ran a full magazine. Yeah. I can't think of who that was. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it just showed that. Some you know, schmo did it. I something think. like that. I mean, he's weird. Some weirdo. He's an odd guy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, they are tough. People the can say what they want. Weird guys? <laughs> no, the high points. I mean, people can say they're what tanks. they want about a high point, but they're tough. When when people ask me, I can't afford much. I just want a gun for my bedside table and a little safe. I always tell them high point. Yeah. Because if if you're not carrying it, I mean, if you carry it as like a cinder block on your well, on your belt. So it's mm -hmm. not fun to carry. But they run. They absolutely run. I tell you what, give me give me a yeet cannon. I'll shoot that sucker. <laughs> hey, that's fine. And they actually named it the yeet cannon. And that that's probably one of the first guns that the internet named. Oh yeah. Like they lit they literally came out and said, "What should we name it?" And everyone said, "Yeet Cannon, Yeet Cannon." And them they some bitches it? put Yeet Cannon right on there. They, they sure it. did. <laughs> they sure did. Hey, and you know what? More power to them. I I think it's it's good for a company to respond to uh, you know, both criticism and support when yeah. the, when their fans come in and say, "Yeah, we want you to call it the Yeet Cannon." And yeah. They go, "Hold my beer." Well, and, and they make it the Yeet Cannon. I, I love when companies... Give the people their Yeet Cannon. Yeah, exactly. I love when companies embrace <laughs> who they are. You know, High yeah. Point does not go around going, oh, we're as good as HK. <laughs> you know, they're like, no, we're High Point. You know, we're affordable, but we run and we work. And we'll embrace the humorous side of it with the Yeet Cannon and stuff like that. Have you, you know, seen the new High Point? No. There's a new one? There's a new like High Point? Like past the Yeet it, Cannon? So, so it's, you know, they're carbine? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're doing that I little short yes. carbine with the yes. with the pick rail on the back. I have seen it. That's pretty slick. Yeah, but I, love, I should get one for a video. I love that companies like that embrace who they are. Companies like Caltech who will embrace innovation, because that's mm -hmm. one thing that's frustrating to me about our industry. We've got some of the best engineers in the world in the gun industry. Oh, uh, George Kelgren is a genius, and we just keep sure. popping out AR-15s. Yeah, it's like, dude, I love the AR-15 platform. Don't get me wrong. But if we got these engineers, where's my space gun? <laughs> where's, I mean, where's my laser blaster? That is one you know? thing I can appreciate about George Kelgren because yeah. he is a genius. I mean, yeah. that, that guy has so many crazy things floating around in that head of his, and we, he's not even done. And and they're smart about it. If, if something is flawed with a gun they release, and it's been inevitable every time they kind of pushed out. I remember the KSG when it first came out? How many issues did that thing have? But they're like, all right, we see where that was flawed. We're going to fix this, fix this, it. this, and this. And now it's a phenomenal shotgun. It really is. And I like that KS7. The I little single, yeah. the single stack one. I haven't like, shot it yet. And it's a light little gun. And and, and look, with full pressure, combat yeah. loads, it sucks to shoot. It's highly unfun. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> but for a light little bullpup shotgun that's 400 bucks, so you can stuff away, like yep. it's, it's a great little gun. And, yeah. and, and I love it. And, and it has that space age look. Yeah. What's not to like about that, y'all? And and they're innovative. That that's the thing. It's like always be thinking outside the box and sure. don't give a crap what people think. You know, it, it's one thing you learn in, in in content creation, right? You know, that was therapeutic for me. I was never able to do this. You know, fourteen years ago, if you'd have said do a video, do a podcast, do a radio show, I'd been like, uh. But it was therapeutic for me. It kind of got me out of my shell. It showed me, hey, I can do this, but you have to learn quick. Don't listen to the people out there that are naysayers, the trolls, whatever. Embrace the trolls on YouTube because every time they comment and one of your fans comments back, that's another view. <laughs> Thanks, trolls. <laughs> I mean, but, look, you but know, yeah, just the innovation. be authentic, be yourself. Exactly. And, 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 you can and do it'll that all with, come. And you can do that with innovating guns. Is, mm -hmm. is Be authentic. Be true to who your company is, who your designer is. And, and it'll all happen, you know, as long as you're willing to tweak things. Don't go into it with a big ego. Ego will kill any kind of business. I agree. Yeah. What's the best way for people to reach out to y'all if they want to talk to you about programs? Yeah, just mgs.edu. You can hit request info. You can also see prices, the program. You can see every hands-on project we do. Mm. Um, but mgs.edu, request more info. I'll put a link yeah. down in the uh, description box below for you guys. I'll put it right at the very top so you can go and check out uh, Zeke's uh, you know, gunsmithing school.
Dude, I'm really excited. And I've known about this for a while. I've wanted to, you know, break it to people and, and, and do this video with you for some time. I know we've, been, we've all been busy. Yeah. But I'm glad we finally had an opportunity to do it, man. Absolutely. Me Appreciate too. you coming and hanging out. Yeah, it's been you. really good to catch up, dude. Yeah. I know we had a long talk before this. Yes. Some stuff we can't go into, more personal things. But it's always good to catch up with people and, and know what's going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, look, life's complicated. It is. It, there's Life a is lot of stuff that happens, man. And, and you, and like we said in the beginning, that social media thing where you think you're connected with your friends, yeah. you're not. Get, call them. That's Shoot so them true. a text. Yeah, you know? call, call your friends, guys. Yeah. It's really important. And I, I think that I'll just end by saying that I've, I've been guilty, man. I've been really guilty of, of not staying in touch with my people. Yeah. I think, you know, this upcoming week, I'm going to definitely get, get with some folks. You know, I need, to, I need to call Dave. I need to call Tim. Yep. I need to call Greg. You need to call everybody. Yeah. You need to call Wreck and Crew. We need a to meeting have, of the minds. We need to have a, a, the OG <laughs> range day, range day. You know, <laughs> that is a fantastic idea. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just a small group of us. Yeah. Like about four or five of us, and we just get together and go full gonzo. Well, I know it was, it was three years ago, three or four years ago at range day. Me and Dave were sitting back, and we were standing there, and we were looking around. And then Such walks up, and we're looking at each other, and we're going... Oh my God, we're the old guys now. <laughs> Cause oh, there's, there's so don't many, say that. <laughs> there's so many young, like it, it, you know, content creators out there, yeah. and we're looking at them, and we didn't recognize anybody. Yeah. And they all knew each other, and they're talking, and we're we we looked at each other, and we're like, "Yep, <laughs> we're the OGs." <laughs> that's, that, that sounds like something that needs to happen. We're, we're yes. gonna put that together. All right, Greg, I'm calling you out. Okay, we're coming up there. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, we're going to show up in the middle of the night with some ninja suits on. Don't shoot us on the porch. I'm sure you got all kinds of shotguns. Well, if you right. go to Talking Lead's 100th video, uh, he's got some booby traps. You, you don't want to go Oh, some booby traps? Yeah, it hurts. Nice. A lot of electricity. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not well, That's fun. good to know. I'll keep that in mind. I'll talk. Don't worry, Greg. I'll talk to Zeke about where all the booby traps are, <laughs> and I will circumvent the booby traps. I'm going to raid your fridge. I'm going to make a video raiding your fridge and then post it later, and you're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I feel so violated. <laughs> all good. Hey, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I know this video was kind of uh, long, and we rambled a bit. That's, that's famous for me when I have guests. We always go off on the rails especially, that's all with, good. especially if we have the same level of add oh yeah you know it you know it <laughs> zeke and i we're we're, we're, we're an interesting pair when we get together but i appreciate you guys tuning in hope you enjoyed today's video definitely check out mgs trade school uh there's a link down below you can click and uh, go check out the programs if you want to support uh zeke he's a great dude and um i appreciate it have yourselves a wonderful day many more videos on the way thanks again zeke Thank you. My man, appreciate my bro. It. All right. We'll see you all soon. Have a good one. See you guys.